The BBC's Chris Hogg reports from Tianjin. Speeding like a bullet from Beijing. This journey is three times faster than it used to be. It's a glimpse of tomorrow. China's building the world's largest network of high-speed trains. The destination, Tianjin. Already one of China's biggest cities, it needs to grow. More and more people want to move here. By the middle of this decade, more than half the population in China will live in cities, fueling growing demand for energy as homes are built for the new urban middle classes, increasing greenhouse gas emissions unless cities can become cleaner and greener. In 10 years, we will build an eco city, which is resource saving, environment friendly. Tianjin is one of more than 500 so-called green cities planned for China. It's a good slogan, but hard to achieve in practice. Here, they're working with Singapore to try to ensure they can turn their model into a truly sustainable reality. This is what life in much of the eco-city could look like in 2020. These silver surfers are part of a growing number of elderly people here. Someone's going to have to look after them. China's officially an aging society. More than 7% of the population's over 65. That figure's set to double by the mid-2020s, meaning China is aging as fast as Japan. Caring for growing numbers of elderly people will be an opportunity, but also a challenge for China. Increasingly, private companies will be used to provide this kind of care, creating new jobs as the industry grows. But the burden of paying for this care will fall on younger workers, on taxpayers, and, where they can afford it, on the elderly themselves. So will China get rich before it gets old? No one can be sure. Trying to predict a country's future needs is never easy. And in a China still changing so fast, the job is even harder. Chris Hogg, BBC News, Tianjin. Well, for more on the challenges that China faces in the decade to come, I spoke to James Fallows of the Atlantic Monthly from New York. James, great to have you back on the program. Of course, we in the West have always had a weakness for Chinese statistics. But when you look at the vision of China, that China has presented of itself in 10 years' time, you know, 500 green cities, high-speed rail networks crisscrossing this vast country, is that wishful thinking? I think it's certainly it's it's an ambition, and as as anyone who's worked in China as you have uh, understands, there are a lot of things which can go wrong between the conception and the execution. But a strength of the Chinese system over the last 30 years and the last 10 years has been setting a target and moving purposefully in that direction. This often is in contrast to the U.S. Uh, fits and starts in similar ways. So I think you have to give them the benefit of the doubt that they'll probably uh, be headed that way. And what are the things that could go wrong? I think that, that if you, there's a long list. I think environmental crises of various sorts are one big factor for anything about China's future. There also is the fact that China's economy has been uh, so dependent on export markets in the rest of the world. They're trying to recalibrate that, but they still are vulnerable to shocks of this sort. Uh, inside, Chinese people say that the real estate bubbles are not really that, that severe in the big East Coast cities, but there could be possible implosions that way. There are always this chronic unrest in the countryside, so it is a very big, very fast-moving uh, juggernaut. And as long as it keeps moving forward, uh, everything is fine, but it's, uh, it's, it's everything in motion constantly. I mean, you can see, James, why the Chinese government would come up with this sort of very futuristic vision of, of what the country should be. Do ordinary Chinese people buy into that vision? In my experience, most people buy into the part of it which says, for my family, we're more likely to have an actual house five years from now than we are now. My children are likely, or my child is likely to get a job. I am likely to be able to pay for my medical care. So as it converts to circumstances for individual Chinese people, on balance over the last 30 years has been more positive than negative. And that is one of the uncertainties we've talked about, too. If the master plans seem to not be reaching the ordinary people, that would also be an impediment to their realization. Well, let's, let's ask you then, James, to look into your crystal ball. In 10 years' time, what will China be? 
China, I think, will be a bigger, faster version of what it is now. It's essentially, it's already every contradiction contained in one. It has some of the most modern cities in the world and some very, very primitive people as people who are among the richest in the world and people who are among the poorest. So I think we'll see a more intense version of that. Probably what I personally am watching most closely is whether China is able to use its scale and purpose to make advances in energy and environmental and climate technology, which will both solve its problems and help solve our problems. So that has my interest. What about its military clout? I think that is a lagging indicator. The, the gap between Western militaries, especially the U.S. and Chinese military uh, capacities is so enormous that even though the Chinese rate of growth is large, there still is a long way to, to close. So it's possible that misunderstandings over Taiwan become, be, could become dangerous, other misunderstandings in the South China Sea area, but that is something that I, I would put lower on the list of things for the Western world to be uh, actively concerned about. James Fallows, as ever, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. In its pragmatic search for markets and raw materials, China sometimes resembles the East India Company, which formed the mercantile foundation of the British Empire. Now, we're not suggesting for a moment that history will repeat itself under a different guise, but while the West has been agonizing about how to lift Africa out of poverty, China has been investing in it, big time. Many development projects are now being supported by Beijing, and that's led Western countries to rethink how they deliver their aid to countries like Tanzania. The BBC's Humphrey Hawksley is there. Tanzania is an African country with no conflict and no famine. It's looking for trade and investment to speed up its development. But millions still live in poverty. British aid helped pay for this village water supply, a basic human need. Nearly 40% of Tanzanians have no easy access to water, and it only arrived here two and a half years ago. It took such a long time. People used to fight over water. We're so grateful. Britain is one of the biggest donors to Tanzania, and with the aid budget protected, the government is now examining exactly how it's being spent. But also, a whole new way of dealing with aid has come to Africa. China is here with billions of pounds to spend, and it's rewriting the rules on international development. Chinese engineers are putting up a hospital cardiac wing that will be built, equipped and staffed completely by China. And unlike with many Western projects, these engineers don't get expensive perks. They live on site until the job's finished. This whole hospital unit will be built in less than a year at a speed and cost that far undercut anything that Western companies can offer, and far less red tape too. One thing the Chinese say is that they provide aid with no strings attached. For example, human rights and democracy are never laid down as conditions. We treat African countries as brothers and sisters, as equal partners. We will not impose anything to them, but we will introduce our work. This stadium, together with mining, roads and railways, is part of the big Chinese push to win trade with Africa. In this Chinese clinic, Tanzanians get subsidized treatments. So, with China doing so much, where does this leave Britain? No cuts in the budget, but a new aid partnership with the Chinese. We need every penny of Britain's budget and all the other budgets, too, that the developed world has uh, signed up to. But the answer is that in partnership with uh, China, and that is a high priority for the coalition government, we will be able to do much more to speed up development in Africa. After all, aid is a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. But here they talk about the politics of aid. So will it be a partnership or, as in the past, a competition for influence among richer countries? Humphrey Hawksley, BBC News, Tanzania. For all the talk of slashing budgets, protests in the streets and economic turmoil, one of the few exceptions to the rule is, of course, China. The country's economic growth continues at breakneck speed and they export the lion's share of the world's rare earth metals. 
The materials help power everything from cell phones to missiles. In other words, we're pretty helpless without them. Now Beijing apparently plans to slash export quotas. The result, jitters around the globe that make the fuss over the Chinese currency pale by comparison. China calls the reports unfounded. But as Zoe Conway reports, it reveals just how vulnerable the world supply line may be. Space rockets can't launch without them. Wind turbines won't go round. And a cell phone won't vibrate. Modern technology would come to a grinding halt without rare earth minerals. These are uh, 17 elements on the periodic table that uh, most people don't know about or remember. These are things that are in blackberries and precision guided munitions, submarines. Uh, you name the application uh, that's high tech and it probably has rare earths in it. The minerals have names like yttrium and lanthanum, but these days it's tempting to call them unobtainium because China, which produces more than 90% of the world's supply, is accused of choking off access to these minerals. The New York Times is reporting that China has imposed an embargo on exports to the US and Europe, whilst one of China's state-owned newspapers says export quotas will be reduced by a third next year. Today, the Chinese government denied the reports, but they admit that production and exports will be restricted for what they call environmental reasons. The Toyota Prius uses more rare earths than any other object in the world. Yet, the Japanese government say they haven't been able to import a single ounce of the metals since last month because China has stopped shipments to them as part of a territorial dispute. From a security perspective, we have to be extremely concerned because... Peter the, uh, Leitner is a former senior trade advisor at the Pentagon. He's worried because America's smart bombs use rare earth magnets. Yet right now, not only does the U.S. lack the capability to mine the minerals, it no longer makes the magnets. It creates a situation that if uh, we'll be asking the Chinese to ship us magnets and other materials necessary for us to shoot at them. The PRC controls now the entire vertical uh, chain of production, from the mining to the fabrication to the creation of, of se semi and finished products. At this rare earth mine in Mountain Pass, California, they're hurrying to catch up. The mine's owner, Molly Corp, hopes that in two years it could be producing 20,000 tons of the metal. But by then, the world's demand could be 10 times that amount. China's stranglehold on the market will last for several more years. Zoe Conway, BBC News, Washington. Well, joining me now from Detroit to discuss this vital market and China's dominance in it is Jack Lifton, co-founder and director of Technology Metals Research. Great to have you on the program, sir. Tell me, what are the Chinese up to at the moment? I think the Chinese are actually uh, gathering a scarce resource to, uh, for their own use. That, that's my opinion. And I think what's, what's really going on here is that they, they can perceive a shortage for themselves. And uh, it's, uh, you know, who gets, who gets the, their, their material? They've decided they get their material. And uh, we have been asleep at the switch here. We have not produced this material in eight years now in the West. We haven't refined it in five or six years here in the West. Uh, we've now got to turn that switch back on. Unfortunately, it takes quite a while to do that. The uh, mines you're, you mentioned earlier uh, might be producing in a couple of years the raw material, but to go from there to the metals and the alloys and the magnets could take right. several years more. You know, one thing I find really fascinating, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I read that in Afghanistan, where after all we've made a considerable sacrifice in blood and treasure, it <clears> is the Chinese who are controlling, buying, purchasing rights to mines for rare earth metals, not us. Well, I think that's right, and, and it, it's sort of ironic, isn't it, that the, the Chinese are able to do this under the protection of NATO armies. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, and this has to do with people ignoring what's right in front of their face. But, Jack, just to get back to the main point here, in your opinion, this is not about the Chinese holding the rest of the world to ransom. This is about them basically needing the stuff for themselves and not being able to sell it to other people as much as they were before. That's, that's right. That's, that's, that's exactly what, what's happening here. And even with the Japanese, there's not a, a hint of kind of gunship diplomacy here, rare earth metal diplomacy? I think the, uh, the Japanese and the Chinese are having a bit of a dispute about the, the natural resources under the sea. In, in, in areas of the sea, they both 
claim to have sovereignty over. And I think that the Chinese have yeah. just now realized they have a cudgel right. they can use in this dispute, rare earths. Jack Clifton, fascinating stuff. Thank you so much.